Did it really happen? Did man really walk on the moon, just as Kennedy had challenged NASA to do? We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The photos of Apollo 11 moon landing have been criticized as being too perfect and looking like they've been photographed inside a TV studio with spotlights. Bill Casing is an ex-Rocketdyne engineer who points out that there should be a blast crater underneath the lunar module, but there isn't. Award-winning filmmaker and photographer David Percy has written a book called Dark Moon which shows that the famous Apollo 11 photographs 
were all shot using multiple light sources, something which can't happen if the astronauts were really on the moon. Jim Collier, an American investigator, has pointed out that the lunar module was far too small for two astronauts in full spacesuits to maneuver around inside. Jim Collier also believes that some of the footage showing the lunar module blasting off from the moon's surface has been filmed using a rotating model, just like the special effects techniques Hollywood blockbusters use today. Now, for the first time on film, we present new evidence which proves that at least some of the official NASA photographs taken on the lunar surface are definitely faked, or at the very least, heavily manipulated. Join us now on a quest for the truth to the moon. In this film, we shall not only prove beyond all reasonable doubt that many of the official NASA images of lunar exploration are fake, but we shall also examine the motives for the biggest lie put before the world. Why did NASA repeatedly fake lunar images and photographs? Why did NASA stage lunar expeditions which did not happen? The answer will surprise you. It can be summarized in just two words, money and UFOs. Before we look at the motives for lying on such a vast scale, let's look at where some NASA scientists came from. Pienemunde, Nazi Germany. For centuries, warmongering nations had been using primitive rockets as a weapon of war. China, Britain, and of course Hitler's Third Reich all used rockets to terrorize their enemies. Werner von Braun was an SS officer and rocket scientist. His team at Peenemunde designed the first cruise missile, the V-1 Doodlebug. The V-2 rocket was the forerunner to the Saturn V rocket, which would supposedly take man to the moon.
At the end of World War II, the American government were desperate to get hold of the Nazi rocket weapons, which had wrought havoc on the innocent people of Britain. The American government launched Project Paperclip, which secretly changed the war criminal files on Werner von Braun and his colleagues. Files which described these SS officers as an ardent Nazi were changed to read not an ardent Nazi. Werner von Braun, his team and the rocket factory at Pienemunde, which had terrorized Western Europe, was transported to the USA lock, stock and barrel. It soon became clear that the Nazis had a secret space program at Pienemunde and Nordhausen. The Hanabu craft utilized alternative propulsion systems such as Vril power, possibly back engineered from recovered crashed flying saucers. Prescott Bush was the grandfather of today's George W. Bush. Whilst working with the Bank of America, and the Jewish Warburg brothers in Wall Street, Prescott Bush helped arrange vast loans to the Third Reich. The Third Reich space scientists used Jewish prisoners as slaves to build gigantic underground bases and manufacture the V-2 rocket which would terrorize Europe during 1944 and 1945. At Nordhausen and other sites in Germany and Austria, Werner von Braun and his team of Nazi SS engineers built vast laboratories and rocket factories. The interior of an entire mountain was excavated to accommodate a secret space facility which was no less than one million square feet. It was here at Nordhausen in top-secret underground bases that a huge number of experimental rocket ships and circular flying disks were developed. The prototype V-7 craft was powered by engines manufactured by BMW. The V-7 used 12 BMW 028 engines, which were powered with helium. Radical fuselage shapes were developed, which would later... Werner von Braun and his team closely studied photographs of UFOs which had been photographed in Germany, Austria, Switzerland and Russia.
these unidentified flying objects inspired the development of Nazi flying discs. After World War II, the underground base at Nordhausen was rebuilt in the Mojave Desert, a place we now know as Area 51. But the men were fighting took place, and we, I'm just completely baffled right now. Uh, so is uh, Mr. Anthony Hilder. Example of one of the many objects seen regularly in Las Vegas, a um, very bright object just uh, basically hovering over Las Vegas, um, 5.30 p.m. Um, cylindrical uh, object, a craft. We believe it could be some kind of an observation uh, uh, platform. volume of evidence is that the space program that appears on the television news uh, and has done these last few decades is actually only there as a, um, uh, a movie to um, hide the real program um, which is um, actually uh, uh, exploring things that uh, these guys already know are there. There's this secret agenda in which um, advanced knowledge that people uh, in general never hear is passed on to the chosen ones that um, are chosen to have this information and to move it through the generations. Uh, the agenda for centralized control and all that stuff. Um, and then there's the movie which is there to hide all that and the movie is the official version of events that pours out of the television. They're being sold a cover story to hide what's really going on, not just in terms of the space program, but in every area of our lives. I mean, what is the more classic and obvious cover story than weapons of mass destruction, we've got to go and get them. And uh, uh, clearly, you know, we see it was a cover story now. If you had a brain, you could see it was before. I've said in my latest book, um, uh, Tales from the Time Loop, that um, we're looking at the Fourth Reich. And then I put under that brackets, or a continuation of the third, which never ended. People have no idea, in the general population, because no one tells them, of the fundamental connections between the Nazis. The people now think, oh yeah, the Nazis are gone, and the American administration. First of all, um, the Nazis were funded uh, out of Britain and America. Um, why is it that they were taking their wages home in wheelbarrows during the Weimar Republic? Germany was in economic catastrophe. A few short years later, they have a war machine that's taking on the world. How did this come about? Anyone ask? Um, well, let's, let's ask the Bush family. Because, um, and this is not just me, other researchers have come up with this, and a guy called John Loftus, who, is the, uh, who runs the Holocaust Museum in Florida that um, Prescott Bush, who is the grandfather of the present president, um, he was a major executive of the Harriman Empire in America. And they had a company called the Union Banking Corporation, the UBC, which interfaced with the uh, banking and uh, steel empire in Europe of a guy called Fritz Tyson, who was named at places like the Nuremberg trial and elsewhere as a major funder of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. And what Prescott Bush, who was, who was the key executive in the Union Banking Corporation, was doing was funneling money and other resources through the UBC into Tyson's empire, and then it went to the, to the Nazis, and that's where the war machine came from, also through the Bank of England. Only yesterday, every business, every profession was part of Hitler's system. The doctors, technicians, clockmakers, postmen. Practically every German was part of the Nazi network. They believe they were born to be masters, that we are inferiors, designed to be their slaves. Um, a number of companies in which Prescott Bush was involved in uh, were closed down during the Second World War under the Trading with the Enemies Act. Um, William S. Farish, whose grandson is now Bush's ambassador 
to uh, Britain, William S. Farish III, a uh, very close friend and uh, horse interbreeder with the Queen of England. Um, his grandfather, um, uh, William S. Farish, uh, was president of Standard Oil, the Rockefeller Oil Company, when it was um, exposed as supplying the Nazis with oil during the Second World War, while you know, they were supposedly in conflict with America. So what you had then was this um, uh, CIA, British intelligence operation, called Project Paperclip, which was to get the Nazis, the major Nazis, with all, and, and a lot that w with tremendous knowledge that are not uh, registered by history, out of Germany, so they would be safe, and into South America and North America to continue this agenda um, up to the present day. And so this is why you have Nazi after Nazi turning up as founders of, of, and creators of NASA and all these other institutions, the CIA, that appeared immediately after the Second World War. In 2003, the skeptical magazine Fortean Times claimed that no such craft or Nazi secret space program had ever existed. But we have been given patents from leading German manufacturing companies, including Juha, Krupps and BMW, which prove beyond all reasonable doubt that Hitler considered the Nazi secret space program a top priority. And more than 15 billion Deutschmarks were spent developing craft of all shapes and sizes. Secret memos from SS officers revealed that Werner von Braun and Hitler both believed that there were alien civilizations in the universe. And it was their intention to not only conquer all nations on planet Earth, but to also colonize the moon. Gentlemen, the conquest of outer space 
is the greatest technological challenge of the age in which we live. The first decisive step in the conquest of space will be the placing of an object into an orbit wherein it will indefinitely circle the Earth. 1954. Sputnik 1 shocks the world and puts the USSR way ahead in the Cold War. Sputnik 2 takes a dog into space, the first living creature to leave the face of planet Earth. Russia then shocks the world by sending an unmanned probe to the moon. Meanwhile, the US Army plan Project Horizon, a plan to colonize the moon with Americans. This plan was soon abandoned when the true nature of the hostile environment of outer space was discovered by American and Russian scientists. In 1958, spectacular rocket failures destroy American morale. The Explorer 1 space probe confirms planet Earth is surrounded by dangerous radiation. Radiation so powerful that it could cause nausea and cancer. The Van Allen radiation belts and solar particles from the Sun are extremely hazardous to humans. Space is also full of micrometeorites which can rip through spacesuits and metal in the blink of an eye. Meanwhile, Russia celebrate getting the first man into space, Mr. Yuri Gagarin. There was already a parallel space program and it had been continuing from even before the time that NASA was created in 1958, October 1958, NASA were, were incorporated by President Eisenhower. The secret space program was run by the Department of Defense. It took its original form in Project Horizon, which was uh, established in 1959, the habitation of the uh, colonization of the moon. The reason for that was that any the, whoever controlled the moon controlled the earth. If you could uh, launch rockets from the moon onto your enemies on earth they couldn't possibly retaliate therefore you had the upper hand. There was a serious attempt, uh, certainly a, a serious investigation, to put man on the moon and keep him there. So the secret parallel space program continues to this day. There is a military space shuttle, and even the ones that we see from Columbia onwards um, are designed according to the specification of the Department of Defense. If you look at them, they will carry spy satellites into orbit. And if you want to know what a spy satellite looks like, the Hubble telescope is one. That is the design of what's called the KH-12 keyhole satellites, which are used today over enemy territory which is presumably any territory that is not American. Regardless of the dangers of radiation, and without having spacesuits nor spacecraft which can protect the occupants from radiation, NASA convinced the American people to pay $40 billion for the space program. The most lethal forms of radiation, of course, are at the higher end of the spectrum. That's gamma rays and X-rays. 
Uh, we know what ultraviolet can do. If you stay out too long in the sun, you get sunburn and skin cancer and die, and it's all very sad. But gamma rays, and x-rays especially, are particularly lethal to humans, unprotected humans. There was no protection that I have been able to identify. I've been found no reference to it. I find nothing that will tell me what level of protection is offered, so I have to assume none was. I've contacted the manufacturers of the spacesuits and they said there was no radiation protection built into the spacesuits because I asked them if these same spacesuits could be used by technicians to go to Chernobyl or Three Mile Island because the nuclear reactors produce the same radiation as produced in space. They said no, not advisable, no protection. Ex-Nazis were now in charge of vast amounts of tax dollars. In today's value, the Nazis at the heart of the NASA space program were given more than $600 billion. All NASA had to do was announce a new space project and the money was handed over so that the American government could save face in the Cold War. Alan Shepard and John Glenn were blasted into space using equipment which was still in the prototype stage. John Glenn reports UFOs to mission control, which he describes as looking like fireflies, similar to the Foo Fighters reported by pilots during World War II. Werner von Braun and Hermann Oberth were later to confess that they both believe alien life forms exist and may have already visited planet Earth in the past. NASA soon learn that we are not alone in the universe. In Jonathan Eisen's excellent book, Suppressed Inventions, he interviews Werner von Braun's mentor and teacher, Dr. Hermann Oberth. Dr. Oberth makes it quite clear that he has studied the aeronautic performance of UFOs. In 1972, Dr. Hermann Oberth made the following statement. Today, we cannot produce machines that fly the same as UFOs do. They are flying 
by means of artificial fields of gravity. This would explain the sudden changes of directions. This hypothesis would also explain the piling up of these disks into a cylindrical or cigar-shaped mothership upon leaving the Earth. Because it is in this fashion that only one field of gravity would be required for all the flying saucers. Dr. Oberth then added, we cannot take credit for our record advancement in certain scientific fields alone. We have been helped. And we have been helped by the people of other worlds. Dr. Hermann Oberth was the greatest pioneer of astronautics. Hermann Oberth made his statement in 1972. Almost 20 years later, in 1991, amateur footage of UFOs stacked up in a cylindrical formation was filmed in Mexico City. It's a monopoly that is being conducted through science about the possibilities of finding life in a different planet or satellite in the space. We have many other reasons to believe that NASA has been lying in every respect. It's very difficult to know if the politicians know the real truth or not. We know that there is government inside the government. We know that there is a military intelligence. We know that in America, after the Manhattan Project was created, that group subsists. And that group was the one who handled the Roswell crash, the Socorro crash, and others. Majestic 12. Yeah, probably it's a different name now. Now it's not Majestic 12, now it's something else. <laughs> I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports. It's very difficult to know if Bush and Blair and others are puppets or they are innocent or they are the mastermind. What we really know is that uh, there are many who decide together what to do in any kind of situation. The Russians now have a very different policy around this phenomenon. We have to remember that when Gorbachev met Reagan, Many times he asked about the technology that the United States have obtained from the others and always Reagan joking replied to Gorbachev, what did you do with it too? They never said we are speaking about alien technology, but many times they spoke about the other technology. And we know that Gorbachev renounced to the race, the cold era, because he learned that the United States had technology 
from these beings. From the greys. From the greys. <laughs> From then on, we saw many cosmonauts talking openly about what they saw. We have different videos recorded by these cosmonauts where you can see strange things floating in the space. Non ho fatto in tempo a prendere la macchina fotografica o una videocamera perché è sparito da circa 7 secondi. A che livello ti lena? Cacoi c'è su Gimli? We have also something very important, which is a video taken inside the space agency in Russia, where you can see the mirror surrounded by dozens of bright objects. This is Mission Control Houston. We are using the payload bay cameras right now to hopefully catch a glimpse of the Russian space station Mir as it performs an on-orbit burn. The uh, payload bay cameras are positioned such that they're looking straight back, back, straight back behind the orbiter where the Mir is flying at about 850 miles behind it. No joy from here, sorry. Hope it was a good one though for our friends. Thank you, sir. We could not see it here either. We'll wait two or three more minutes till sunrise, and then uh, at that time, give you a go for KU Stowe. We're at mission lapse time of seven days, 13 hours, and 17 minutes. This is Mission Control Houston. The Amir uh, Space Station is now visible. Yeah, we do see something flashing visually, but we're not sure that that might be, uh... This shot was obtained by the shuttle, by the Americans. NASA never released that piece of video. It means that we have two different positions. One that is openly saying, yes, we have experience out in the space, the Russians, and we have the other, which is the NASA explanation that there is nothing in there, they don't release anything. We have to obtain every evidence from an outside source, but not from NASA.
there are creatures living in outer space. And I'm, I'm the first one to realize how crazy that sounds. Um, scientists would immediately say, well, that's impossible. There's ultraviolet radiation in space. Uh, without having a craft around you, you'll die. Well, all I can say is that these, I call them space serpents, um, they do exist. They've been filmed by Story Musgrave, who's a senior space shuttle commander. He's been with NASA for 30 years. He's seen one of the space serpents on two occasions. He's filmed it on one occasion. They've also been filmed from the ground, flying around in the upper atmosphere. Now, quite frankly, we don't know anything about the life cycle of these creatures, but they do fit in with the descriptions of other kinds of critters, other strange looking creatures that astronauts from the very early days of NASA have reported. Um, I suspect that they use some form of photosynthesis and I suspect that um, they hydrate themselves by flying in the upper atmosphere of planets. One important thing I must say though about these space serpents is that there are about seven or eight very very important uh, ancient sites, temple sites uh, on planet Earth, most notably in Mexico. And these temples are dedicated to the memory of flying serpents. And this is what we see in this footage, is flying serpents. There also seems to be a very interesting relationship between the flying serpent and these small luminous spheres. Houston, we are using the payload bay cameras right now to hopefully catch a glimpse of the Russian space station Mir as it performs an on-orbit burn. Though it will be difficult to uh, pick Mir out from the stars as they pass behind us, the uh, payload bay cameras are positioned such that they're looking straight back, back, straight back behind the orbiter where the Mir is flying at about 850 nautical miles behind us. Well, obviously this is a massive faux pas that this uh, piece of footage was accidentally broadcast. 
The person who's passed me this uh, piece of footage is now dead. Um, the footage that we see mostly of UFOs has been filmed with image intensifying equipment. We're to mission lapse, time of 7 days, 13 hours and 17 minutes. This is Mission Control, Houston. The uh, Mir Space Station is now visible on the uh, far left-hand side of the screen, about, about an inch from the bottom of this particular picture. Okay, the Mir space station is the small flashing light in the center about an inch from the left-hand side of the screen. It's slowly... It is slowly moving closer to the left-hand side and is a very, has a very light flashing to it. We think, on the middle of the screen, way to the left-hand side. We think you can see a flashing light just a little bit to the left of the center of the screen, very faint. Yeah, we do see something flashing visually, but we're not sure that that might be... Uh This is Mission Control Houston. Once again, we believe we were just able to spot the uh, Mir spacecraft as it flies about at 850 nautical miles behind us. Yes, STS-80 was a very, very strange space shuttle mission. What we see is uh, a lot of activity. It can't all be put down to natural phenomena. Um, James O. Berg at NASA and all the other pundits at NASA would uh, love you to believe that these are all ice crystals and space junk and debris. Quite frankly, if there was that amount of debris, that sheer number of uh, shooting stars uh, flying around in close proximity to the space shuttle and the Mir space station, it would be not safe to, to put craft up into space. A piece of rock just a few millimetres across uh, traveling in the opposite direction of the space shuttle uh, would rip through the entire structure of the space shuttle and cause a fatal accident. Well, people always say to me, you know, if there's extraterrestrials and if there's UFOs, why don't they make themselves known to us publicly? Well, I think with the space shuttle mission STS-80, that's exactly what they did do. You see um, objects which are out of focus or they are uh, 
transparent in some kind of way. And the first one comes from behind the space shuttle, comes into the field of view, and they make their way to the upper atmosphere. That's at least what it looks like. Um, it's joined by many others, and you get a kind of rough circular formation appearing. And then you get the piece de resistance, uh, the last uh, orb comes into the center of this formation, and as soon as it finds its position, it lights up. And then you can see a sort of dance of lights around this formation. Now, this suggests to me incredible intelligence. It suggests to me that they are saying, look at us, look how clever we are. And it's a astounding piece of footage. These extraterrestrial craft are attracted to thunderstorms and many, many times we see lightning on the surface of the planet or in the atmosphere of planet Earth. And as soon as these electric storms start, the UFOs swarm into the area. It's almost as if they're harvesting the electromagnetic energy within the atmosphere and in actual fact um, there are uh, unseen forces in the atmosphere um, etheric flows of what uh, the German scientist Wilhelm Reich described as orgone energy and it could it could be possible that these UFOs are sucking energy from these electric thunderstorms on planet Earth and this is where they're getting their energy from. You should concentrate on the first object that appears and you will see that it holds its position. Many TV stations have actually broadcast this STS-80 footage but they only show you the few seconds of the large glowing orb coming from the lower atmosphere. The cameraman who's operating the space shuttle camera is fully aware that the first object has held its position and after the large orb has uh, ascended from the lower atmosphere um, and the shuttle is moving away from the scene, the cameraman is actually zooming in at the end of the sequence to double check the position of the uh, first luminous orb and it's a fascinating piece of video. A few years ago there was an astounding book published, um, it's called The Day After Roswell and it's written by a gentleman called Philip Corso who is now dead. He had a military career that uh, lasted more than 20 years and during that time he served at the White House and then he was a senior official at the Pentagon. 
And in this book, which is an astounding book, he clearly says that there is a war going on in space. In other words, NASA and the American military have designed weapons. Uh, he says in his book that some of the weapons are based on patents. Uh, the genius inventor Nikola Tesla. Philip Corso tells us that there are plasma beam weapons being used against these UFOs and that sometimes these UFOs are hit. A special team then travel out to wherever it is in the world and collect the wreckage. Now from the wreckage they back engineer uh, any useful technology. In his book he clearly states that microchips um, semiconductors, uh, fiber optics, lasers, many other uh, new metal alloys have all been back engineered from wreckage which they've collected from UFOs which have been shot down by the American government. I believe that what we're seeing with the footage from Space Shuttle Mission STS-48 that we are seeing several intelligently controlled extraterrestrial craft and yes I do believe that the flashes are the firing of some very very top secret weapon which is able to produce an electronic or electromagnetic plasma kind of death ray that is being used against these UFOs. I do believe that that is exactly what we're seeing. Space Shuttle mission STS-75, the Tether incident. A lot of a, a lot has been said about this incident. Um, personally, I feel that most of the objects that you see are actual individual parts of the Tether, uh, just floating around in space, and that they're out of focus. It's a fascinating piece of footage, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't, you know, quite a few UFOs coming into the scene to check out our technology, just as the same as they've done many times before. The crew can see the tether and uh, see the satellite, that it's beautiful. This view uh, showing uh,
the satellite. Again, uh, just moving into sunrise. 81 nautical miles now from Columbia. You clearly hear one of the astronauts uh, being told there's an object at your 11 o'clock position. It's about your uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock going away. Don't worry about it. And the other astronaut, who's obviously uh, in the know, uh, says don't worry about it. Out there. I'm not sure what you're talking about. I suspect that the senior astronauts uh, the astronauts who have been up more than just once uh, are fully aware that there is uh, a very large number of unexplainable objects flying around. Never mind. NASA spent gigantic sums of money during the 1960s, but most of it was spent on the ground, not in space. Huge American corporations, many of which were manufacturing hardware for the military, made gigantic profits designing space vehicles and more importantly, life-sized models of spaceships and even huge stage sets resembling the lunar surface. Someone in NASA had realized that after taking billions of dollars from the American people, if they couldn't make it to the moon, they would fake it to the moon. Obviously, if you're going to somewhere that nobody has been before, you need to have a simulator which recreates that environment as closely as you can. If you're going to the moon, you recreate the surface of the moon. And here we see a section of the lunar surface created. It's about 30 foot high, 30 foot long, 35 foot long. Scale is given by the two people standing in front of it. There were plenty of simulation exercises, but the point is, and this is, should be taken into account in virtually everything that is discussed with the Apollo program, 400,000 people may have worked on the program in total, but none of them had a need to know more than his own job required. The people who were making the rockets didn't know what the people who were making the spacesuits were doing because they had no need to know about that. Their job was to make the best models and the best uh, simulation of the lunar surface that they could. And if we come up to this picture here, we see the three scales on which these models were built. We have here the whole moon as one unit. It stands about 20 foot high. We have here behind it a section of the surface of the moon. You'll notice it's curved. And here we have a more detailed section of the lunar surface. What you're saying is that the images which we're told show a camera pointing out the window of the lunar module as it's coming into land on the moon could well have been filmed previously using these large-scale models. That's right. It could well be that what we are looking at are films of realistic models. We have no means of knowing if they were actually taken on the lunar surface or whether what we're watching is part of the simulation exercise and the training exercise. And you'll notice here on these models there is a camera track a camera starting at this end, coming down here, would approach the moon or appear to approach the moon and become ever closer towards it. It's exactly what you would expect to see if you were flying to the moon. 
This is a simulation rig that was built. Uh, this is the command and service module of the Apollo program. And you'll notice that the window here looks out onto a block here. And there's another one here. They're curved. These are the screens onto which the lunar surface was projected as the craft made a simulated approach towards the lunar surface. Is what we're seeing a mixture of fact and fiction. It is fact. It is fiction. It's mixed together. It's hard to separate them until you examine it closely. If a spacecraft is in deep space, the only possible explanation for a light seen through the window of the spacecraft is the sun. It's the only bright light in space. If it's not the sun, then it has to be some other artificial light which implies that that particular image is possibly fiction. July 1961. NASA was soon being criticized for the flimsy construction of their hardware. The first orbital capsules did not even have windows in them for the astronauts to look out of. One of the most vocal critics was one of NASA's most respected astronauts an all-American hero named Virgil Gus Grissom, who almost drowned when recovery helicopters were unable to lift his space capsule from the sea. After a successful journey into space, Gus Grissom almost died through NASA's bad planning. Or was this an early attempt to silence Gus Grissom? May 1963. Astronaut Gordon Cooper experiences re-entry problems in his Faith 7 rocket ship. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Roger, and lift off and the clock is operating. Roger clock. Take my seven, Faith 7 on the way. The prototype lunar module, known as the LIM, had serious stability problems. At this stage, there was no guarantee that even if NASA managed to get a spaceship orbiting the moon, they could land safely without killing the crew. Could the footage which we see of the limb approaching the moon be filmed in a TV studio? It was filmed in a TV studio. There's absolutely no doubts whatsoever about that. And the way that this film was created was by the use of models. There's nothing secret about the models. They exist. You don't see them today. The models were very lifelike, very realistic. There is one that is a life-size model. It's in Flagstaff in Arizona. It's two miles long and it's an exact replica of the Sea of Tranquility. The photographs were used to create from those images the replica of the Sea of Tranquility so that if it was flown over in a helicopter it would appear as if it was a spacecraft approaching a similar area to land. So yes, all the scenes of the lunar surface were filmed on Earth. June 1965 
Gemini 4 is launched and the first man walks in space. Extensive rehearsals at docking spacecraft were performed in low Earth orbit. Everything was recorded on film. This footage would later become invaluable as NASA sought to fake the success of the Apollo missions. Meanwhile, more problems occurred. On Gemini 9, the second spacewalk had to be cut short due to problems with the astronauts' oxygen supply. On Gemini 11, another attempt to walk in space was curtailed due to fatigue. Was this a sign that cosmic radiation caused nausea and fatigue? NASA could not risk the public humiliation of having brave astronauts crashing to their deaths on the lunar surface broadcast on live TV. NASA's Nazis knew that a major catastrophic failure on the moon would cause the billions of dollars of funding to be immediately cut. Anyone with the most elementary grasp of science could tell that the Saturn V rockets were merely big versions of the Nazis' V-2 killing machines. It is wrongly perceived by the mainstream media that there has never been an official report of a UFO by any NASA astronaut. This is simply not so. 
Since the early experimental orbital craft were developed by ex-Nazi SS officers on behalf of NASA, American astronauts have continually reported strange UFOs. In many cases, photographs and even film was shot of these mysterious, unidentified flying objects. During his pioneering orbital flights in the Gemini 7 capsule, NASA astronaut Jim Lavelle clearly alerted mission control of a bogey at 10 o'clock high. Capcom at Houston asked James Lavelle if he had an actual sighting of a UFO. Lavelle answered, we have several, an actual sighting. On the 4th of June 1965, astronaut James McDivitt reported seeing a cylindrical shaped craft. Could this be one of the cigar shaped motherships which have been filmed from the ground on many occasions, most notably in Russia and California during the 1970s? former astronaut Gordon Cooper has publicly stated that his interest in UFOs was one of the reasons why he became an astronaut in the first place. In 1978 Gordon Cooper attended a meeting of the Special Political Committee at the United Nations General Assembly in order to discuss the UFO phenomenon. In a letter signed by Gordon Cooper he said I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets. In 1951 I had the opportunity to observe flights of UFOs of different sizes flying in fighter formation from east to west over Europe. In a tape recorded interview given by Cooper in 1973 he stated, For many years I have lived with a secret in a secrecy imposed on all specialists in astronautics. I can now reveal that every day in the USA, our radar instruments capture objects of form and composition unknown to us. I wonder, did you have anyone call you about a strange plane or airplane or something in the air? Did you I was coming down Samson Drive. I don't know what it was. It was a flying saucer. What did it look like, ma'am? It was like a, uh, almost like an iridescent color. It was like a bluish purple. I could see a red glow up in the sky. It was huge. These people are serious. They're very upset. Whatever it was, lit up, I mean, literally, if you were underneath it, you could see it would be like daylight, but red light. It changes colors from white to red to green. The sucker has not moved. We have multiple departments right now that have sightings on it. Right this now. is not a prank phone call, I swear you can't call. No, is it? They're sitting stationary. I got three of them. What do they look like? Yep, I've got four discernible colors. Uh -huh. I got red, yellow, green, and blue. And the one just was like flashing. So if they're those planets those guys were talking about, uh -huh. then they're uh, planets with Christmas lights on. This is weird. Uh -huh. In 2002, astronaut Scott Carpenter was interviewed by the late Graham Birdsell of the British UFO magazine. Scott Carpenter and his fellow veteran astronaut friend John Glenn both witnessed strange creatures in space during their pioneering flights. Now, there were so many unknowns in the early days. And this is a fact of the matter. We were really not sure after John flew whether or not there were critters, living critters, out there somewhere. Uh, 
После этого значит, у нас тот засудит, мы все ведем, а потом начинается проверка дневника. Yes, we have some, not thousands, some cases when Russian astronauts watched objects. Yes. Very, maybe few, not so far from the space station. Mostly over the Earth, very close to Earth, but it doesn't matter. From outer space, you can see it as if it's very, very close to you. And I talked to Musa Manarov, and I talked to Gennady Strykalov and the other astronauts, and they m told me that they have seen much more cases of UFOs, but without possibility to film it, because he said, it's always like with Russians. When you see something, whether this camera is without battery, or with battery lying at the other end of a spacecraft, or, uh, as Musa once told me, I see strange, interesting object, but at the same time a spacecraft is coming to me and I need to dock it and I can't leave the place and film it. You know, we have been investigating this particular question and we came to very interesting conclusions. I wouldn't say that millions of people or thousands, no, but there are many people who have not been abducted because on their level of knowledge and on their level of understanding and abilities, they do not need to abduct people. No. Um, I will try to explain what's going on. When, when you say they, you're talking about the... It is, yes, it yes. is, it is. Um, when it is a coming, a flying here, um, s there are some kind of a scientific expeditions which are visiting the planet. For us it was very unusual to find out that the deepest and the first, the most important interest for them is the God, who is He. They are looking and searching for God yes. and His uh, creation ways understand everything. And they can learn it only in one way if they learn and check how big human groups are behaving, kind of an invisible influence and how people are reacting. At the same time, there is another very interesting technology. When they, it is, I mean, when they meet a person, they take from a person kind of a informational hologram. This hologram, which any human being have, um, contain in itself information about previous lives, about present life, and some, something about possible future. They take this hologram, informational hologram, and then to be able to read it, to decode information, they need to have a special key. This special key is the th sample of your way of thinking. For this reason, to have this key, they somehow transmit into your brains a hard idea, like, just an example, you are living wrong, you broke our laws on this planet. This is the reason why very soon when the, when the sky became dark, Thousands and thousands of people will die 
and only few of them will stay alive. And at this particular moment, when a human being starts to analyze this, this information, they just read it, you know, like they take it like from a computer. Hops, that's it. They don't need anything. They take this hologram, they take this key, and then keeping this hologram anywhere there, they can have any information about a human being and what's going on with him and his surroundings. Regardless of whether the Apollo moon landing was faked or not, an interesting photograph hangs on the wall of the sanctuary of the Scottish Rite Masons in Washington, D.C. This photograph shows astronaut Neil Armstrong holding a Masonic apron over his spacesuit. The photograph has seemingly been taken on the moon, or at least on a studio set which resembles the surface of the moon. Neil Armstrong has become a mysterious character since his alleged moon expedition. According to the records of the Ohio Grand Lodge of Masons, Neil Armstrong's father is a Freemason. In fact, Neil Armstrong Sr. is a high-ranking 33rd degree Freemason. Neil Armstrong's co-pilot, the second man to have allegedly walked on the moon, was Buzz Aldrin. At the time of the Apollo 11 mission, Buzz Aldrin was a 32 degree Freemason. They were in good company, as many of NASA's astronauts were also Freemasons, including Gordon Cooper, Walter Shearer, John Glenn, Edgar Mitchell, Thomas Stafford and Paul Weitz. These men were all members of the Brotherhood, all sworn to keep secrets on pain of death. These astronaut Masons were under the leadership of Kenneth Kleinnecht, who was NASA's Apollo Space Program manager. According to an article and photograph published in the Masonic magazine Scottish Rite Journal, Upon his return from the moon, brother Buzz Aldrin presented a flag to Sovereign Grand Commander Smith, who was the Supreme Commander of the Supreme Council of 33rd Degree Masons of the world. The flag Buzz Aldrin presented had been taken to the moon on Apollo 11. According to a Masonic lecture delivered at Beauvert University in 1994 by American Masonic historians, astronauts Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong performed a Masonic ritual exactly 33 minutes after touchdown on the lunar surface. They temporarily planted the international flag of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, which features a large double-headed eagle Therefore, the eagle has landed. Engine arm off. 13 is in. We copy you down, eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The eagle has landed. Roger, Twin. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. And we're getting a picture on the TV. The short Masonic ritual Armstrong and Aldrin allegedly performed declared the celestial body of the moon to be the property of the Masonic God. 
who is the Masonic God? As confirmed by former Supreme Commander of the 33rd Degree and Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, Albert Pike, the Masonic God is Lucifer. The name of NASA's space program, Apollo, according to the Holy Bible, is actually an alternative word for the devil. We can see this in the Bible as the word Apollyon. Apollyon appears as the name of Satan in the original texts of the New Testament Gospels. Like Christopher Columbus and many explorers before them, Armstrong and Aldrin used a flag to claim territory for their monarch. Upon their return, NASA space program manager Kenneth Kleinecht invited the Apollo crew to a secret Masonic ceremony, which saw Kleinecht's brother be appointed to the sovereign grand commander and titular head of all Scottish Rite Masons throughout the world. Once you learn the occult significance of words such as Apollo, Columbia and Atlantis, you will realize that the occultically inspired murdering Nazis who developed NASA's space program have used names which are part of ritual, magic, and the occult. Hawati in Tawi, Tim Jaffa Kau, Tarpin M. Awif, Mu F, Tarif, Sem F, Menemenet F. Nebet, Hayat Nebet, Henenet Nebet, Jedefuit F. dark side of the moon, the secret face of our satellite planet, which only a few men in living history have ever seen, there lies a star-shaped crater called Parsons Crater, named after the rocket scientist John Parsons. John Parsons is known by several names. He was born under the name Marvel Whiteside Parsons and soon became involved in the occult. Charles Taze Russell, who invented the Jehovah's Witness movement in America, predicted that the beginning of the end of the world would commence on October 2nd, 1914. On this very day, rocket scientist John Parsons better known in occult circles as Jack Parsons, was born. A brilliant rocket engineer, Parsons soon entered into correspondence with SS Nazi officer Werner von Braun, and by the age of 13 had begun summoning evil spirits and demons using magical rituals which Parsons had learnt from British occultist Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley styled himself as the Beast, and Jack Parsons referred to Alistair Crowley as his father. Three, 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 
Grand Master of the Priory de Sion, Jules Verne, had written several books which strongly influenced the mind of the young Jack Parsons. In 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Jules Verne prophesied the invention of a submarine vehicle which could wage war from the depths of the oceans. In newspaper reports read by the young Jack Parsons, he saw German U-boats launching futuristic torpedoes traveling under the sea and causing death and chaos. Young Jack Parsons wrote in his journal that if the French author Jules Verne's submarine was a tangible possibility, then why not the rocket ship which traveled to the moon and back in Verne's other books? For most of Jack Parsons' adult years, he was an adept of occultism and a distant disciple of Alistair Crowley. When Crowley visited California and gave the go-ahead to form a new chapter of his OTO, Satanic Secret Society, it was Pasadena, the hometown of Parsons, which was chosen. Jack Parsons developed and patented several liquid and solid fuel rocket engines. His patented designs are still being used to this day on intercontinental ballistic missiles such as Polaris and the Space Shuttle. The Polaris nuclear missiles use Parsons rocket technology which has a pentagram shaped void impressed into the solid rocket fuel to aid faster burning. Parsons also patented an acid aniline mix which was used on the first generation of Titan nuclear missiles, used to deliver deadly warheads and also used for high-level atmospheric tests. Coincidentally, Jack Parsons' occult mentor, the British beast Alistair Crowley, used to often call himself the nickname Titan. On April the 15th, 1942, Parsons demonstrated a plane powered by two liquid fuel rocket boosters at Edwards Air Force Base. The test was witnessed by Alfred Ledding, who fronted the US military's Project Sign, which investigated UFOs and helped cover up the phenomenon for decades. <laughs> Jack Parsons revered the English Satanist, Alistair Crowley, and eventually became the leader of one of Crowley's secret cults called the OTO. The OTO, or Ordo Templi Orientalis, claims descent from the Bavarian Illuminati, which had been revived by Adam Spartacus Weishaupt on May 1st, 1776 and had approximately 2,000 members in Masonic lodges in London, Paris, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Munich and Ingolstadt. The Illuminati was essentially controlled by European, Germanic, Jewish aristocrats who sought to replace the church, government system and national identity of nations with an Illuminati-controlled superstate. The Illuminati was eventually outlawed in Europe and the founders fled to America. They then fragmented their maverick secret society into fraternities operating from the campuses of Yale, Harvard and Princeton. From his pulpit in Brooklyn, New York, charlatan priest Charles Taze Russell prophesied that from October the 2nd, 1914, the beginning of the end of humanity would commence, with the emergence of the Antichrist and Babylon the Great, as foretold in the Bible's Book of Revelation. 
Jack Parsons, born on that prophetic day, would later attempt to invoke the incarnation of Babylon and also sign an oath stating that he was indeed the Antichrist.